Okay, very good. <clears throat> All right, thanks for having me. Um, so my name is Rich Ames. I'm the GIS coordinator for the town of Natick. Uh, we started flying uh, back in September of uh, 2016, you know, right when the new Part 107 rule came out, we started flying uh, right away. So I'm going to kind of go over, you know, how I talked my boss into letting me fly and what we had, uh, what the hoops we had to jump through to uh, to make it happen. So let's, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the first question you got to ask is, you know, why do you want to fly? Um, you know, why are you putting a drone up there? Why, why are you collecting imagery or why are you collecting video? And that kind of drives what kind of license or legal authority um, that you, you're going to have to obtain. Um, if you're just flying for fun, you know, there's a whole set of rules that are just for that. If you're having trouble sleeping at night, you can go read House Resolution 302 and the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2018. Um, and that basically covers all the things that you can fly just for fun um, in, in detail. Um, if you want to fly to make money, so it's any kind of compensation, right? If you're getting, you know, a free dinner at a wedding, you know, for flying the drone, that's considered a commercial operation. If you're flying for business, if you're flying for a real estate agency, you know, that's commercial operation. If you fly for a town, that is considered a commercial operation. And then the last one is um, basically schools and institutions, which have this this concept called a certificate of authorization, which is essentially you set up your own flight rules in coordination with the FAA. And it's a massive process. It's essentially you hire a lawyer and you go through this back and forth. If you love bureaucracy, you know, the COA is, is where you want to be. Um, so that's kind of step one, right? Obtaining why do you want to fly determines what level of legal authority you need. For most of us here on this webinar, it's going to be part 107. That's the easiest thing for individual pilots to go out and get that authorization to fly commercial. Um, then once you decide, you know, you know why you want to fly, now you got to now you got to start, you know, meeting matching equipment up to your mission. Um, so that determines, you know, the type of type of drone that's going to be up there, the type of equipment that you're going to need on the drone, and the sensors, which include cameras and videos or multispectral sensors. Um, and again, the camera drives the drone. Right, so what kind of camera you want, or what kind of video capture you want, drives how big or how small or how complicated you know the drone is going to be. Whether you're going to need multiple operators, one person to fly it, another person to operate the camera, right? And then you got all this data. Now you got to do something with it. So you bring it back into the office, and these are all things you need to think about ahead of time because we're talking we're talking videos, we're talking very large multi multi gigabyte data sets, and sucks up a lot of room. Um, storage is a lot cheaper than it used to be, but it still takes up a lot of space, and you got to have a home for it. And you got to figure out a way of you know what what the procedures are going to be for how you get the data off the drone and into your computer systems, into your storage systems, where a way where you can get that them um, and share it with your group and then process it. Um, and then processing also involves, you know, what are you doing with the imagery? Are you just making videos for happy snaps of, you know, of the parade through town, or are you actually flying subdivisions where you're going to need to have some mapping software like drone to map or, um, or drone deploy, some of the free ones that are out there. Um, let's see. And then the last thing is um, analytics. You know, once you have these images, what are you going to do with them? Um, so you, you have it, you've created a product, you either have a mapping surface or you have some sort of 3D model, um, what are you going to do with it? So you the organization or disseminate it to the public. Um, so again, things when you start sharing image sets this large, you start getting into the data stream issues uh, with, um, you know, with external platforms. So again, all these, these four things you got to kind of ask up front, and these will be the drivers of what kind of license you need, what kind of drone you got to get, what kind of hardware and software you need, and then what are the procedures in place to get this stuff out to the, uh, the public. Um, and then you got to come up with a cool logo so you can brand your, uh, your imagery. All right. So anyway, so now I'm going to get into, you know, our story for the town of Natick or how I talk my boss into you know, letting me fly. Um, our town, like a lot of towns, we have two of these gigantic water towers. They're four and five million gallons each. And the Commonwealth of Massachusetts requires us to inspect these things um, once a month. So, and so not normally required, you know, putting up a ladder on the side of it and sending it a guy up there. Now, in the, in the good old days, we just kind of slap a ladder on a truck and do whatever and just get up there and, and check it out. But there's, um, there's obviously lots of issues with, uh, with putting ladders on the sides of buildings. Um, according to OSHA, you know, falls are the number one cause of death 
um, in occupational hazards and ladders are the number one cause of fall. So anytime you can remove a ladder from your operation, that's a risk removal and that should be an absolute win um, um, you know, for, for your management. Um, and again, you know, four months a year, our reservoirs look like this. So it's just uh, not something you're gonna wanna put a ladder against. Good, next slide. And then if you do it the right way, then you start getting with third party vendors, it gets expensive, it's time consuming. It's just not something you're gonna be able to feasibly do on a on a monthly basis and a regular basis so with our program once a month i go fly the two reservoirs i take pictures of all the hatches you can zoom right in and get the serial number on the padlock if you want and then we have a time stamped you know geolocated image that says on this date at this location this hatch was locked here's the proof so that was a win the boss said sure go ahead you know go, go get the drone next slide please Okay, so legal requirements for commercial operations. So what we're under, um, for most people, there's now 100,000 pilots in the United States that are flying to part 107. Um, and basically it's a 60 question test that you need to take at the FAA. Um, you, if you already have a pilot's license, you can um, basically take the test online and you get a certificate on top of your license. If you don't have a license and you have to go to the center and take the test and you get a separate certificate that enables you to fly commercial. Um, the license is good for two years and then you got to renew it every two years and it's a 40 question test on renewal um and like i said it's not a it's a, it's a lot of the answer, a lot of the questions on the test are common sense but you have to know faa lingo you have to be able to read a um a vfr or a sectional chart you have to be able to read um a weather chart so there's definitely specific information that you need to do you cannot go into that test cold um, for commercial operations, each of your drones needs to be registered with the FAA. That registration is good for three years and it costs $5 a piece. And the drone registration must be shown on the outside of the drone. Um, you can't be on the inside on a battery anymore like it used to be. That was a change just this year. And then when you're flying, you know, the, the basic license is just, you know, daytime VFR, which is, you know, nice weather, um, you know, over nobody and over no moving cars and you standing on the ground everything else basically requires a waiver if you want to fly at night if you want to fly over people if you want to fly from a moving vehicle there's a waiver for that and you apply for those and they, they last for a certain period of time good uh next slide and basically rich so what you're saying is the closer you get to an airport different restrictions may apply Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a whole, whole yeah. For most of the country, to get outside, you know, the urban areas, it's pretty much all uncontrolled airspace, and you can basically fly up to 400 feet. Um, you get into more urban areas. Um, it basically, any airport that has a tower uh, under Part 107, you need to get authorization to fly. Um, and there's different ways to do that. Um, you can go to the FAA website. There's this new thing called uh, Lance, the Low Altitude Authorization something cooperation um, and you can get basically real-time authority um, to fly up to 400 feet within five miles of an airport it's a very good uh, um, um, a program it just started um, last October um, and there's certain airports like you get like within you know you get really close to the big airports like the class B's in Boston you can't fly at all um, but there, there, there are ways around it and again it gets and that's for commercial license for uh, recreational licenses um, you, you can't fly within five miles of an airport without prior approval or you need to be flying in a recognized flying field but that doesn't really cover us so um, okay so a little bit of the cost breakdown for when we bought uh, back in uh, 2016 we went with the DJI Phantom which is kind of a prosumer level um, all in all when we bought everything with the drone and the backpack and the extra batteries and all the propellers and the and the, and the controller it was just about twenty three hundred dollars um, you could probably get the same package now through a third-party vendor because they don't sell the Phantom 4 anymore they sell a Phantom 4 Pro you could probably get the whole the exact same package for under a grand now so for relatively short money um, you can get a very capable drone up and going and flying you know and creating professional products you have to do with mapping um, um, another really important thing, um, when you're flying, and if you're going to be flying commercial, and you're going to be flying for your, um, for your organization, you've got to make sure that you have your insurance rider ahead of time. We didn't, we just assumed we were covered, but the insurance companies have been very quick um, to throw a clause in there saying, does not cover un, unmanned operations. Like, um, so you've got to make sure you get that extra rider on there for your insurance, or you will not be covered. 
um, but it's important because you're one, you know, broken propeller away from a from a very, you know, high profile accident. Um, so most of the planning software on the computer on the that comes with the drones is is free. Um, like I said, no, the DJI stuff has a lot of flight planning software, so you can basically fly around a point or you can fly a grid over a point, depending on what kind of flying you do. Um, there's more advanced sets that you can pay for. Um, once you process the imagery, basically if you want to turn all those individual shots into a map, then you're going to need another piece of software. Um, we use a native Esri drone to map, which does a fantastic job um, for our purposes. Um, that costs about $1,500 a year um, for a subscription. Um, but there's also free ones out there like drone the map that have a limit on size. Um, let's see, other costs, the exam itself is about $150. Um, so total up costs, up, upfront costs about four grand and fifteen hundred dollars a year because there's no fuel in this thing. It's just batteries, and hopefully, assuming you don't crash it, um, you shouldn't have any repair costs either. Um, and just, just a reminder, real quick for everybody, if you do have questions over the course of this, uh, just make sure to answer them in the or ask them. I'm sorry, in the questions box, we're going to go over them at the end of the session. So if there's something specific to your department, or if there's something um, that you just have that is unanswered as the course as we go through this, just you know. Make sure to fill in those boxes. Thanks. Okay. And uh, just to briefly mention, we we upgraded our we purchased another drone uh, last spring. We, we got a um, a unique H520, uh, which was a hexacopter. So that means you know six motors instead of four, um, and, and able to basically swap out different camera pan, uh, um, a payload. So we had like a a telephoto lens, a wide angle lens, and even a, a small thermal camera. Um, that was about $7,000 all in. Um, so again, and then you, they kind of go up from there incrementally uh, for, your, for your price point. So you can easily start spending, you know, twenty, fifty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000 on these things if you, uh, if, if you want. Right, good, next slide. Okay, and Jarlath, it's, it's your turn up at bat. Great, so I'm Joel O'Neill Dunn. Uh, like Jordan mentioned, I'm the director of the Spatial Analysis Lab at the University of Vermont. We got interested in drones after we got hit with Tropical Storm Irene back in 2011 and realized that traditional remote sensing capabilities didn't give us a good way to do damage assessment. So since that time, we've had a wealth of experience. Um, we've probably got about $380,000 worth of equipment, over 700 flights, a bunch of uh, licensed UAS operators, very proud, unlike the rest of the country, uh, the majority of our pilots here on campus are, uh, are, are women. And increasingly, we've been working with organizations to look at how they integrate UAS into their operations. And hopefully today I can share some of our experiences that'll give you folks some insights as you move forward on this uh, magical journey into UAS. Next slide, please. So some of the key advantages of UAS, and I want to put this in context of if you took your remote sensing class in college like I did 20 years ago, or maybe even 10 years ago, a lot of that revolves around spectral imagery and these types of things. When it comes to drones, we really need to dial in and think about what are the key advantages of them. Number one, flexibility, right? So you can just get out there and fly at the right times, and that's really crucial. Maybe you're looking for a particular kind of species. You may not need a super fancy sensor if you can just fly when that species species greens up or catch that flood at the, the exactly right stage. Spatial resolution, right? No matter what aerial imagery you have, you're almost guaranteed that a drone can get higher spatial resolution. You're not going to map your entire town or county with a drone, but for areas that you need to go in and get detailed imagery, drones are really unparalleled. Temporal resolution, the ability to go out and hit a site over and over again, particularly useful for things like compliance mapping or change analysis, those types of things. And finally, the cost savings, right? Your ability to either run the program in-house or pay a contractor to go out and image a small area that would cost you a lot more if you're going to satellite or aerial imagery providers. Next, please. Uh, some of the key components that we consider for programs are, number one, you know your policies and procedures. Rich did a very nice job giving the lay of the land for the legal requirements. You want to also think about your organization, right? What kind of training does someone need to have before they operate a system or sensor? What kind of metadata and retention policies do you need to have, right? You also want to make sure you have your drones and your sensors, right? And uh, are they the appropriate drones, which we'll get into in a little bit, for your type of application? 
issues. And then your information technology, right? Your cost for data storage, if you're doing a lot of flights, could make the cost for drones look like a drop in the bucket. And depending on the types of analyses you do, you may find that your existing geospatial software may or may not work really well. So it's important to think those things through. And then finally, your people, right? And not just your people who are going to fly the drones, but the people are going to do the analysis, the people that meet, need to approve those flights. They may be someone in risk management. Those are all really core components of your program. Next, please. Uh, you know, when you think about systems, it's important to keep in mind that one system doesn't do it all if you want to have a really robust UAS program, which laid out some really nice capabilities that you can get with some of the prosumer models. But if you're interested in flying larger areas, mapping stream corridors, integrating different types of sensors, then you're going to need multiple platforms. You're probably also going to want multiple platforms because things don't always work well. We often joke around that drones should be sold in packs of three. There's the drone that doesn't work, the drone that you crashed, and then there's the drone that you actually get to fly. So the multi-rotor systems out there, these are great for inspection, videos, limited area mapping capabilities. Then we have fixed wing, much more robust for mapping larger areas because they've got lift, a heck of a lot safer because if they have a system failure, it's gonna to glide to the ground um, rather than fall straight from the sky. And then you've got the sensors to think about. You know, do you want an RGB? Do you need an RGB for corridor mapping? So the sensor may need to swivel. Do you need thermal or multispectral capabilities? These thermal and multispectral sensors, especially, can cost you several thousand dollars. So you can see how you can quickly go from maybe a $1,500 drone, but if you want to add these additional capabilities, that's where you can decide hey, is this something we want in house or out of house? Next slide, please. So some of the key and uh, Rich, uh, just to slow you down for one second, Jarlath. Rich, there's some noise coming on in the background over your um, microphone. If you can just, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Um, sorry, Jarlath. I appreciate that. No problem. Yeah, so some of the keys to success that we see out there. First of all, if you're in government, right, tracking and accountability are going to be pretty important, right? Are you storing your flight logs? Do you have flight checklists to make sure that people went ahead and confirmed everything was in good order, right? Are you preserving your imagery and handling public records acts correctly? These are all things that can really suck up your time in a drone program. And if you have good uh, systems and policies and procedures around that, you'll succeed. Your, your human resources, it's easy for all of us in the geospatial field to get wrapped up around the, the cool software and the hardware and the sensors, but it's your people that make everything work. And once again, not just those that fly the drones, but those are the whole team and the back end and your IT folks. And your information technology, like I said, is not something to neglect. Um, drones may be small, the areas that you're flying may be small, but you can go out and do a bridge inspection and one that we did we ended up producing 11 gigabytes of data, right? And that's for one, one bridge, right? Point clouds and 3D models and all these inspection photos and thermal, et cetera, et cetera. So you can really create a lot of data very, very quickly. And if you want to back up and retain that data, you want to make sure that you budget accordingly for that. Redundancy, really important. Like I mentioned, things go wrong with drones, right? Do you not just have backup drones with backup propellers, extra batteries? If you're flying with laptops or tablets, maybe one of those fails in the field, or perhaps an upgrade invalidates your flight planning or flight tracking software. It's always good to have multiple ones of those as, as well. And then really, really important, right? You're going to collect all this great data out there. And how do you make it accessible to the people who make the decisions out there? And I think that's what's great about something like MapGeo, right? To make it easy for people to access the wonderful geospatial products that you're generating from your drone data. Next slide, please. Um, so your approach, you know, and I think one of the decisions is, do you want to do this in-house or do you want to contract it out? And you may, in fact, want a, a hybrid approach, right? Um, or you may want to do something like we do with a lot of organizations. We come in and we help them get their, their program started and then they get off and running, right? So in-house, I think especially for, for key tasks where you need to get out there and you need to get out there quickly, having that in-house capability for, you know, fire, police, accident, scene, reconstruction, and some, some basic 
basic capabilities, but then maybe it comes to something fancy like multispectral, or perhaps you need precision mapping. And that may be where, you know what, gosh, the, the cost of getting these systems would be into the six figures, and it's just going to be cheaper for you to issue an RFP for those. Um, and when you do those, just keep in mind to think about specifications for your products, just like you would any other geospatial product, and not only ask for the final deliverables, but also think about having the original data in case it needs to get processed at some time. So I think uh, next slide, and we're turning it back to Rich for some of his great examples. Perfect. And yeah, we're, we're definitely going to jump back. This is Jordan once again, right before Rich jumps on and, and show you how an in-house program can be run and the benefits within that. Um, and and Jarleth is very, Jarleth is very um, careful to point out that there are risks involved, but at the same time, there are a lot of things about drones that make them easier to fly these days. It's not all it's not all litigation and, and doom doom and gloom stuff. It's, it can be done well. Um, so I hear Rich now coming um, coming up, and we'll show some examples from uh, the town of Natick. And uh, Rich, you can take it from here. Okay, very good. All right, all right. thank you, Jordan, uh, and thank you, Jarla. Um, so here um, is our very first subdivision that we flew um, back in. This is October of 2016, right after we got um, our drone. And at this time. I honestly, I had no idea about how even that drone to map software even existed um, or even the, how to do a corridor flight. So I just, we had the drone about a week and I went out there and I flew this subdivision and this is about, you can, if you, if you squint there, you can see that's about 40 images um, that I basically flew by hand. I stood in that, in that, uh, and that, that, that cul-de-sac there and just kind of flew a basic grid and grabbed those 40 images. And then basically brought the images back into into ArcMap, and I was trying to stitch it together myself, and this really wasn't working by hand. And then I, I talked to one of our ESRI reps, and he said, "Oh, you should try this drone to map thing." So I tried that and got that, and then I'm able to pull it and bring it into Map Geo. So now you can share you know, our, our most recent um, imagery for the entire town was from 2015, um, and now here we got the subdivision that went in. You know, just that year, and we're able to share it right away. Because I don't know, it's going to be a long time before we uh, you know, get to fly the entire town again. So we're able to put, you know, these images, you know, right in. So next slide, please. Uh, again, so this is um, this is from our 2015 imagery again. It's a, a large subdivision um, that went in near downtown. This is a former paperboard site, um, so you can see the kind of the chaos that is the the construction. And then next slide. You know, and here it is done. Um, and the nice thing is, you have a little more control over the um, over the uh, the how the imagery looks. You know, when, when you're flying an entire town, you get kind of this base kind of washed out, good even image of the entire town. You know, for 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 uh, for photogrammetry purposes. Uh, but with these smaller shots, you can kind of boost the colors a little bit, and you can make the image look nicer, and it makes it easier to heads up digitize this. So this this project is done, and um, I, we're updating the GIS. Um, with all these, um, the parking layers and the sidewalks, and you getting the building footprints in, uh, this makes, makes a big difference uh, timely, timely wise. Uh, next slide, please. To, to do it again, this is the this is that same subdivision now in um, in in the Map Geo website. So again, you can bring it in as a layer, and now we can show this, you know, to our residents, um, so it matches the existing. And we're also going to see an overlay real quick on the next slide. Uh, of here, the, the zoning overlays that were created specifically for the subdivision. So now people can see, you know, these are smart growth, uh, smart growth overlays that were basically voted for at the town meeting, allowed this paperboard site to be developed, and now they can see, you know, as near real time, you know, as uh, as technology allows, the subdivision that was created and how the overlays interact with it. And you can see how it just lines up perfectly um, with those buildings here. So it's just a nice, you know, real, real quick feedback. Um, uh, to the residents of the town. Next slide. And this is a new salt shed we had put in um, uh, over at our, our um, at our sand pit. Um, and the reason we flew this is because this is right near. Um, there's some sensitive wetland areas right nearby, and there's also our our our, our zone one wellhead protection areas are, are near nearby too. Um, so we needed to show that this structure was not basically in. Um, uh, on that, on that, in that wellhead protection area zone. So again, very short period of time, you know, less than 15 minutes in the field, we can fly and get this very, very accurate um, representation of the pavement and the structure, and again, share it right out with the boards and committees. You know, that uh, on the conservation says, you know, here's a building, you know, it doesn't impact the wetlands, it does not impact the uh, the zone ones. Um, 
stop bothering us. So. <laughs> and uh, this is, this brings me to another point. And is, if there's other departments that you have questions about, feel free to answer them. I mean, to ask them in the questions box. Uh, we do have questions coming in right now, so just be patient. We'll we will get to them. I promise. Uh, but at the same yeah. time, if there's anything that's more specific to you that you're wondering, just just go ahead and fire away. Yeah, and I think you'll find you know, if you start a drone program in your town, you know the word will get out quickly because you know we started just within the water department, but then in a very short order we had the the police and the and fire and planning and conservation and the senior center and the schools knocking on our door, um, uh, you know to, to, for to, to utilize a drone to create to create some mission stuff. We have some more examples of that coming up. So good. Okay, and this is an engineering example. Um, we've been doing this a lot lately. Um, so basically, you know, whenever a, a project gets done in town, this is, um, in this case, it's a sewer force main. And on the right, you can see, you know, the larger extent. This whole force main is, you know, probably a, a couple miles long. Um, and then as soon as a project is done, we can we fly it at a very high resolution. You can see on this um, on the image on the left that black line there in the middle. That's the actual trench. You know, so a, a year from now, or never, if we if we ever get the as built from the company, and after this road's been repaved, we'll know exactly where that trench is. And if we do get the as built, we can compare it. They, they said the trench is here, and we can show bring up this imagery. It's geo reference. You know, it's a one inch image resolution. Um, and with the ground control, we can say, no, no, the trench is actually over here. Here's you know, here's the photo. So it's a great feedback, and our our engineering staff has been very uh, very receptive to this. Good. Next slide. Um, all right, here's a fun one. Um, uh, so this was um, a case in the, the northern part of our town, and this resident had uh, basically permission to do some site clearing and do a little bit of dem uh, the demolition to the property, um, you know, from the conservation committee and from the building building committee. And the next slide. They did that instead. They clear cut the whole thing and just went to town. Um, you can see that on the bottom there, that lake there, that's actually Lake Cotituate, which is part of the state um, a state park. So he built a dock on the state park property. He got into all kinds of trouble. This is a $125,000 fine this guy got. So as far as I'm concerned, it paid for the drone program forever. So I can do what I want. <laughs> and we will make these slides available for everybody as well after the presentation. And okay, we use it for, like I said, the police were one of the, the early adopters or one of the early interests in the drone program outside of the water department. Um, so in our town, the Boston Marathon goes right through it. Um, so during the event, we'll bring the drone down onto the race course and we'll do a live stream back to our emergency operations center um, just so they can get a, a real time feel of, of what's going on. Um, this is like peak crowds here, right at 12 o'clock in Natick. Um, um, and they said we capture you know, the event and then we can again we live stream it so that's been, been, a, been a big plus good and then for marketing shots you know fall and springtime in new england it's it's really pretty so we, we fly around the town um and get all kinds of shots um uh, basically promoting the town um so th th those are fun <laughs> and then we, we take, take a lot of good shots good um, and then we, we use to, you know, anytime you can get a cooperation um, with the school department, it's a plus. Sometimes municipals and, and school sites don't play well together. Um, but this was a great collaboration where they had a, a solar project where they put solar panels on the roof of all their schools. And now they can show off, like, and I can put the drone up and get the kids up there holding the little sign. The sign down there says, you know, Natick loves solar. Um, so it's just, it's just a win-win. So we're giving them something. They're getting something out of it. Everybody's happy. That's actually my elementary school that I went to when I was a kid. Um, and then uh, this was done as a as a demonstration, but this was an actual accident scene in uh, in Natick. Um, uh, where basically I went out and flew it and flew the drone the next day, did my own ground control, and you can see on the lower left side, you know, the resolution that's possible. This is literally like two centimeter resolution imagery, and you can see the paint marks that the um, that the uh, the accident investigator team did this. That's actually a Jersey barrier there that got broken in half. Um, but again, this kind of you know time stamps and basically records forever um, the accident investigation because these these paint marks and the tire marks aren't going to last very long. But this is now preserves it forever. So that's great, and that's a great use for any 911 emergency folks out there. Um, you know, we're touching that a little bit here. 
Yeah, and also it's important um, before we uh, set over the Jarlath um, that you get those um, understandings ahead of time with the police department because you don't want to be getting called at two o'clock in the morning <laughs> or or six o'clock in the morning on, on some Sunday morning to go fly. Um, you know, you want to make sure you've got some kind of understanding of what the what the labor's going to be and who, who's going to be on call to fly the drone. So again, this, discussions you need to have ahead of time um, to make sure that everyone's on the same page. All right. Good. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rich. I think those are just such great examples. We, we've seen so many of these sort of worst case scenarios or horror stories out there where a town buys a drone and it's a you know, $50,000 drone that someone sold them and then they have someone without a license flying it and no clear objectives and it turns out they're in controlled airspace. And I think for everyone on the webinar to see a program that's been really thought through and focuses on the end users. And I think what's also really nice is that, you know, in Rich's case, it falls within under GIS, right? And at many state agencies, sometimes the challenges that we see is that it gets implemented in to the air people and they're very much focused on the safety and security of the airspace and may not always be thinking about many of the downstream things that I've been talking about like the IT and the analytics and those type of stuff. I'd like to share with you some of our experiences on, on UAS operations and applications. So next slide, please. Um, so, you know, Rich talked a lot of about these inspection operations, and these are primarily done with these quadcopter systems. Um, they can be very easy to do with some of the consumer models. You just want to fly up around a bridge. However, as soon as you want to get under a bridge, then you're going from a $1,200 system probably into something that's um, well over $10,000 because you need gimbals and fancy cameras, and also the skill needed to just fly a drone versus fly a drone under a piece of infrastructure, especially if you need to get up close in some of these areas, varies greatly. And drones can really aid you in a lot of infrastructure applications, but do keep in mind, you know, they can't get the hands-on activities and they may not even be able to access certain spaces. So you don't want to scrap your entire maintenance program until you fully tested out your drones and try to think of drone technology and how it's going to integrate with your existing operations, which I think is what's so great about Rich's examples, rather than simply replace those. Um, let's go to the next slide. So, but now let's get into what we do. We're the Spatial Analysis Lab. We're mapping people. And for geospatial products and what you see from Rich's great examples there is generally this sort of five-step process there. Um, because when you go for mapping, a lot of this stuff is, is automated. And in some cases, it can be click button. Now, experience really matters. And you don't want to go and fly the most challenging landscape out there before you've tested these. But with some very simple off-the-shelf technology, as Rich showed you, you can generate some wonderful products. That so number one is flight planning. Two, actually get out there and do the flight operations. Then we have what's called the photogrammetric processing, right? That's where we take all these images, stitch them together to make not only orthophoto mosaics, but some of the other terrain products that we'll show you. Then, of course, we want to turn those data into information through analytics and then dissemination, right? Products like MapGeo, how can you get the data into the hands of your end users? Next slide, please. So, very important part before you get out in there and fly, right? Think about your checklists, and checklists are looking at a product like before you fly or air map. Hey, am I allowed to fly in this location? Sometimes there's a lot of weird and interesting helipads or seaplane areas um, or tiny little airports out there that you may not be aware of. And so make sure you have clearance and that you don't need um, approval for a system like Lance or maybe just calling the helipad. Um, do you have all your equipment, right? There's nothing worse than going to the field without all your gear. Mission checklists can help with that. Are your systems functional? A good checklist, just like a pilot will use in an aircraft when you board a plane, can be very useful in just going through some basic system checks. Hey, are the propellers free of scratches and cracks? Is the camera operational? All these things can set you up for success. Roles and responsibilities. Who's your, who's your lead pilot? Who's the one who ultimately has authority? Who are the observers, right? If you need to secure an area because you're not allowed to fly over people or moving vehicles, do you have folks posted with their signs? Those little checks are important not only to ensure success, but in the case of any type of legal issues, proceedings, or questions about how you operated, you've got documentation on that. And then finally, thinking about metadata, right? And saying, hey, we were at this location at this time. So if someone calls and said, hey, we got a, we got a complaint about drones, and you can say, you know, here's our records of when and where we were flying. Next slide, please. Uh, Post-processing. So digital photogrammetry has revolutionized how we can take 
individual images collected from a drone and stitch them together into geospatial products, uh, whether you're using drone deploy, drone to map, or, or PIX4D, which I believe is still the, the, uh, the engine behind Esri's drone to map, Agisoft, all of these programs make generating these products very, very easy. They do require um, a considerable amount of computing resources, so you may have to decide if you don't have a fantastic workstation with good CPUs and, and RAM, hey, maybe this is something we use some of the cloud-based solutions out there. And so programs like Pix4D, if you buy a license with them, they also give you cloud-based processing, which is pretty cool. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, let's take a look at the analytics here, right? So there's just so much you can do with your drone data. And as I'll show you in a little bit, right, it's not just imagery. And so you can produce point clouds, you can do the volume metric. Uh, 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 estimations, right, all the cool things that Rich showed you out there. Just keep in mind, small area, but you can produce massive amounts of data. So you may think, hey, I'm just going out and flying, you know, uh, 50 or 100 acres, but turns out that your existing geospatial software may not be able to handle the point cloud for that very well. And you may find out that sort of LIDAR specific software packages may, may work better. So once again, just keeping those things in mind and thinking about your program from end to end, not just about the drone and the sensor. Next slide. Okay, so accuracy can matters, and I think Rich talked about this for the engineering products. This was a very challenging product that we did. Um, these are a series of images we've created for construction compliance mapping. As you can imagine, a challenging area to fly because we're flying over people and vehicles. We had to get participant notification, so notify the cars entering the area homeowner notification, lots of legal requirements we had to jump through. But because it was an active construction site, those types of activities were happening. Anyway, we also made the decision, hey, we're not gonna fly with a multi-rotor system that if it falls out of the sky, it has the potential to punch through a windshield or, or hurt someone. We're gonna use a styrofoam wing, so considerations there on safety. And then we had to consider accuracy. It's a fairly large area and we didn't have the ability to put out ground control. So we use uh, drones with onboard RTK PPK system. So those of you that are GPS nodes, you know that that allows us to get down to actually centimeter level accuracy uh, without ground control, which can be very useful in those areas where it can be difficult to establish ground control, particularly if you're working across hydrologic features like streams, or you're just mapping large areas. Much like GPS, right? A cheap and affordable GPS may run you $100 or $200. Uh, Similar thing with drones, right? Uh, a drone with RTK or PPK capabilities, it's probably gonna start running you over $10,000. So if you if you don't wanna have that type of drone, make sure you're coordinating with your survey teams, so you can get appropriate ground control. And if surveyors are going out there anyway, especially for a construction site, try to coordinate your drone activities so you're going out at the same time and you can lay down targets and take advantage so you don't have to call them out again. Next slide, please. So, more than imagery, right? Even though mainly we're focused on producing imagery from drones, the software nowadays is wonderful in that in order to generate those orthorectified imagery products, it produces terrain products along the way. And in some cases now the algorithms are getting so good, we can even filter out above ground features. So over on the right here, you see some, um, some of those different products and the advantages of taking this holistic look at your products. This was for a campground that was acquired under leaf off conditions prior to some construction that they were doing. So this was for site plan. You can see we have the ortho rectified imagery there, right? Those evergreen trees there, largely white pines. You can see they're green, the deciduous trees. They sort of look like they're falling down. That's the shadows. But then we also generated a digital surface model. And then using PIX4D, we filtered that to create a digital elevation model, which is much more detailed than the LIDAR available for the area. So this is photogrammetric. So we cannot see through the canopy if it's dense canopy. But as long as we've got a clear shot to the ground, you can use these digital photogrammetric technologies, which are very simple to use to generate these wonderful geospatial products that you can then ingest into systems such as MapGeo. So next slide, please. GIS integration, right? And Rich has showed so many great examples of these, but the wonderful thing about creating ortho-rectified imagery is it has coordinates. And here's an example of an area we acquired 
after a flood, we mapped out the sediment damage by hand, overlaid the parcel data, right? A really quick way to document the extent of damage. Do we know damage happened in this area? Absolutely. But this gives us verifiable information to go to the state or FEMA to ask for funds, which increasingly we're seeing in these disaster response situations, right? They want not just a ground photo, they want something they can verify and mapped data are wonderful for that. Next slide, please. So volumetric analyses, like I said, when you process your data, you're going to also get 3D models. This is not LIDAR. This is just from a drone taking photos, okay, with a, quite frankly, an okay camera. Okay, this was a contaminated soil pile at a... Uh, area in Burlington. And what we did there is we flew over it. We built a 3D model. We took the, uh, the digital surface model. We did a plane through it underneath to flatten it out, subtracted the two, and we're able to get the volume of that very, very quickly with about 15 minutes of flight operations and then about another 45 minutes of, of processing. Particularly useful, especially in disaster response situations, maybe a road washes out and the area is hard to reach. Next slide, please. And uh, just one pause for a second, everybody. We have many questions for the Q&A session. Keep them coming. Don't, don't hesitate. Uh, just because we have a lot doesn't mean we won't go over them. Um, but just a reminder, and, and yes, we will get to everybody's questions today. Great. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, this was a really innovative project. So the runway expanded at one of our state airports. And uh, one of the key FAA requirements is, is the approach surface, that is the path at which the plane comes to land, because the runway was expanded, does the approach surface still have the appropriate clearance over the trees? The old way to do that was to send survey crews out with laser, laser range finders, sample-based approach, very time-consuming. We were able to take what was a four-day process and knock it down to uh, less than a day using an integrated approach. So we didn't fire the survey crews. We worked hand with the surveyors where they still check the work, but we provided a comprehensive map of the area using a 3D model built from drones. So we acquired the drone imagery, processed it to generate orthorectified imagery and surface models, ran some feature extraction on that to extrude trees, and then put in the approach surface, which is what you see there in the cyan box. And then you can put this stuff right up on web servers or whatever, so people can interact and verify the data, right? So going beyond imagery. And what's exciting is these are just the same sort of random and point cloud products that you folks have been working with uh, originally. The difference is that if you start a, a great program like Rich has, right, you can go ahead and run these things on your own. Next slide, please. Uh, so invasive species mapping, and this is a case in which sometimes these fancy multispectral cameras can be useful. Uh, we've been using it here in Vermont to uh, track water chestnut, which is an aquatic invasive species that blankets our waterways and uh, kills off things down below because it takes up all the light and makes uh, navigation difficult. And so in these cases, we found that, you know, we can see these things with RGB sensors, but they actually do really jump out in these multispectral sensors. Uh, key takeaway here, though, is the multispectral sensors because they're they're heavier, they're not as robust um, in terms of flight operations, we have to do more flight. So that means we've got to be out there longer, we have to have more batteries, uh, we have to hop along the area to uh, to catch, capture different areas, and also the spatial resolution is not as good with them. So keeping in mind that as you swap out sensors, whether it's multispectral or especially thermal, um, which is because the sensor is a lot smaller than what you may see on sort of a National Guard helicopter, that the resolution is not as good and so you're going to have to adjust your flight parameters and flight operations depending on those those sensors next slide please Uh, rock slope monitoring. This is actually an online uh, immersive uh, 3D model of a rock slope we did in collaboration with New Hampshire New Hampshire DOT and once again drones think about more than imagery. You can build 3D models of your your buildings, your rock slopes and they actually integrated this into their rock slope um, uh, risk model and we're able to do detailed measurements with it and sort of you know pretty revolutionary stuff especially if we want to track this rock slope over time you're going to notice the cones there so because we we're flying near traffic we had to block off a lane to ensure that we were operating safely uh, so once again think about within your organization who else you have to coordinate to ensure that you're operating uh, safely and, and legally right it's not just going out there and flying but keep in mind that a 
depending on the system that you use, there can be a lot of risk associated with that. A small one and a half pound quadcopter, if that thing falls from 200 feet, could seriously maim or, or, or kill someone. And so they're taking the time to think through these things can ensure that your program is successful and keeps you um, above board. Next one, please. And I'm just going to let you, uh, this is the last this is one of the last ones before uh, QA, everybody. So if you're excited for QA, just stick around to the end of the slide. We're going to jump right into that. Yeah, historical. Thanks, Jordan. Historical preservation, great way to create digital 3D representations of valuable structures like this covered bridge that, that may be exposed um, to risk and destruction. And if you need to rebuild it, now you've got a full 3D model that you can generate from like a 15-minute drone flight and couple hours of, of processing there, right? Maybe it's not, this model's not being used now, but down the road, it could be useful. And next slide, please. And then just a little plug there, um, you'll see down at the bottom, um, we run a uh, UAS drone workshop um, every summer. It's three days. Uh, state agencies, local people attend. Um, if you're interested in getting experience with everything from safety procedures to checklists to flying fixed wing, multi-rotor drones, thermal, multi-spectral, all of that, and then doing all the back-end processing and analytics, uh, we'd love to have you there. Plus, it's in Vermont in the summer, and who doesn't love Vermont in the summer? And uh, I'll wrap it up there, Jordan. Excellent. So now we're going to go into everybody's favorite part of this. But before Q&A, just want to remind everybody, you may get an email uh, that invites you to our next webinar, which is Preparing Your City for Summertime. And we are going to highlight some great MapGeo examples on how to get prepared for the summer rush, summer tourism. Uh, and we're going to jump right over into QA right now. So I'm going to start from the top here. We do have a lot of questions. Uh, feel free to keep asking them throughout the course of Q&A if you, if, uh, you know, if the light bulbs are going off. And we'll, we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, so, do you find the amount of data you collect and ultimately decide to keep uh, becomes too expensive? Rich, maybe you can answer that question. How do you how do you find solutions to hold data so that it doesn't become too expensive? Yeah. So, yeah. So in the two and two and a half years that we've been flying, I've, I've got about 250 gigabytes uh, worth of data um, in, in our project. Um, so our our IT people. Um, are, are pr pretty good at spinning up new storage spaces. So we, we've got a new server now that can hold up to a terabyte. Now that's an expensive machine, and, and you know, and, you know, the terabyte's nothing to sneeze at, um, e even today. Um, but storage hasn't been the issue yet. Um, I think when you really start getting into um, um, st storage issues and size issues, when you try to push this stuff online, then you then you really got to be you know, thoughtful, like, again, another plug for MapGeo, but how are you pushing this data out there? Because um, it's just, it's, it's a lot of data, and it's definitely something um, you, that, that needs to be considered. Good. Great. No, so we have another question. Make a case for uh, preserving your original data. So sometimes the software that you're using, drone to map, pix 4 d whatever, the algorithms improve, and you may notice areas where you processed in the past and maybe you didn't get great products. And then a, a month later, we've had this situation where a new release comes out. And so the fact that we preserve the original data uh, was really valuable in those cases. But it does add to your eventual storage costs. Correct. Great. And so that just to answer another question that kind of dovetails through that, um, can image, images be used, captured at scale? Um, it depends on where you're displaying them would be the answer. Um, I see the images are all from above. People are asking if there are practical point of view views that you use uh, that we have found helpful. Yes, we have. Um, you know, we did touch afterwards on the use of drones for parades. Um, there's also video like like Rich said, there was a live feed. Is there other examples of videos that you've used from drones, Rich? Um, yeah, I have on our on our uh, our department's Facebook page. Um, I do this little just gimmicky thing of you know name that street or name that park kind of thing, uh, just to kind of drive some interest. So when I'm out flying other missions, um, I'll do some you know, ortho video of a, of a part of town or of a certain street, and then spin up a quick little video using um, uh, just using Windows software, you know, nothing fancy. Uh, if you look at Natick GIS on Facebook, you, you can see some of the examples, and that gets some good exposure to us. Um, awesome. I think, again, I do, a, I do a lot of um, uh, project shots too, kind of before and afters, uh, like for for what the selectmen want to see and what the boards want to see. Again, just this kind of the, that bird's eye view shot. Here's the project area before. Here's the project area after. 
Great. Perfect. I hope that answers your question. Uh, so the answer is a definitive yes, and that's great. It's great to see um, people marketing as well um, with, with drones. So next, um, will, we, will we be making the slides available? Of course, yes, we will. I'll make sure to have a link to the slides in a follow-up email to anybody that attended. Uh, we'll also have the recording available for this, so if you want to show this to other people, um, we certainly can have the recording available as well. Um, and so that answers the next question, will the webinar be made available? Yes. Um, do we ever use drones for interior spaces, inspection of huge pipes, indoor spaces, et cetera? Uh, Rich, I know you have brought the drone inside of the water tower. Uh, maybe you can tell a little bit about that story. Yeah, that was um, – we haven't done that yet. Um, that's the, basically the next time they do the, the water tower, I definitely want to fly the inside of it. Um, and the nice thing about flying indoors, all the FAA rules go out the window. If you're flying inside of a covered structure, you can do whatever you want. Um, but, but definitely it would be, it'd be uh, some value um, to basically build a 3D model of the inside of the water tower. I think that would be beyond cool. So. Gotcha. And just to let everybody know, drones don't typically have sensors for the top of them. Usually it's for the bottom or the sides of the drones. So, again, speaking to some of the examples we talked earlier about inspecting bridges, uh, that's part of the reason for the skill of flying, same as flying in a field house or, in this case, flying uh, in a water tank. Um, so I have a next question for Jarleth, actually. Um, at what point does ground control become necessary? Uh, ground control becomes necessary as soon as you care about the accuracy. So even when we're flying with our RTK PPK drones, very expensive drones that offer on the book one to three centimeter accuracy, the only way we know we're achieving that accuracy is at least if we have some reference points. And so anytime you're not happy with sort of the standard offset we see in most imagery is one to two meters, uh, without ground control, then you want to move to that, especially if you're concerned with making vertical measurements. So in vertical measurements, regardless, even if you're flying with RTK or PPK, you're going to want to have ground control because the vertical plane is a little bit tricky to do from imagery alone. So uh, try to think about, once again, integrating with your survey crews when at all possible. And, and this is where I recommend not thinking of drones as just a standalone technology, but hey, there's someone going out to the field already to collect some data, send the drone team out with those folks. Excellent. Um, and that, I hope, answers that question as well about ground control. And so the next question we're going to jump to um, is, do you have a set of documented general steps that can be used to create a drone program? Um, do, it, do either of you have that? I'm sure Jarlis does. Um, do, do, can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, we, we do. Um, some of the stuff that you, you have on, uh, I think, this presentation will guide you there. There's, there's no, I think, standard set of things that governs every single um, uh, organization um, because your needs are gonna your needs are gonna vary but those key things that we mentioned here right about thinking about your people your training your policies and procedures your IT all those things are going to be very very important and feel free to reach out if you need more details or or if you'd like to come up to our workshop uh, in August and get, get hands-on experience and see how we do things here Excellent. I guess if I could just chime in a little bit. Um, it, it, again, it depends on the size of your program. You know, with uh, us, our program in Natick, I'm, it's, it's a one pilot shop. Um, but we do have we do have some procedures written down for, uh, for certainly for night operations, things that we have waivers for. Um, you're required to have procedures in place for that. Uh, but as your program grows, you definitely need to have <laughs> written procedures. Um, and again, I talked briefly about that certificate of authorization. Which is again, that's a basically a gigantic written procedure um, for your for your for your operation. But, good, perfect. So yeah, it can definitely scale depending on the size of organization is what I'm hearing. Um, and just another question, we're going to jump to the next question uh, regarding photogrammetry. Yes, the use of ground control is to to uh, increase photogrammetric accuracy. Um, so I um, have another question here. This is a longer one. It's I live in Florida and I have an in-house drone program. It is my understanding drones were not allowed to be used in code enforcement due to property rights, and the FAA does not allow flying over people not related to the mission. How was your case able to use drone imagery for this? Um, I'm assuming that means for the parade for, um, for, the, for the marathon. And was there a permit applied prior to the violation in which a drone in the drone use clause? 
So that's a lot. Yeah. So talk about yeah. So so two for the for the marathon, we had permission from from such from the FBI um, to fly for that one um, because they had a no drone fly zone over the entire route. Um, for the violation, this was it was a supplemental piece. There was already a court case in place, um, and there was already a hearing in place. Um, so they were they were looking for supplemental information, and basically um, that that image of the before and after of the site being cleared, it was a uh, it was it was a slam dunk. I do not use the drone on a regular basis for you know, you know for for code enforcement or for you know looking for people's pools or you know new decks or anything like that. That's not what I want the uh, the drone to be used for. I want it to be a positive <laughs> for the neighborhood. Not, not and zone. if I can add to that, Jordan, it's important to note that the FAA does not govern any privacy issues. If there are privacy, that's at your level. But I. When, whenever I talk with departments about privacy, I say, what's your policy against aerial mapping in your, in your state or your county already? You're already using aerial maps. You can swipe your credit card and there's dozens of satellite companies that will gladly sell you imagery. Uh, tell me how the drone program is different. If it's a mapping program, it's no different. If it's a video program, then it's different because you are doing surveillance where you can see people moving around and, and get at intent. And so I'd really think about how it falls into those things, right? And chances are within your municipality, you have police officers with body cameras and license plate readers and look at how those um, technologies are being governed with in terms of personally identifiable information. Great. Well, then I hope uh, th there's another nugget actually in that question. And it's, um, are you able to prosecute? I guess the answer to that would be no. Um, this is just supplemental uh, imagery. So we're going to keep going through these questions. Feel free to keep asking them as well. Um, a couple more about sharing the PowerPoint. Yes, we will. Um, can we get inf more information on the 3D modeling process? Yes. We will reach out probably after the webinar um, about getting more information about the 3D modeling process. But what I can say just right off the bat is um, drone to map is very important as we drone to map. Uh, and Rich, could you talk a little bit more about maybe other solutions besides drone to map that you could use for 3D modeling? <laughs> Actually, the, no. <laughs> the drone map is still the one that I've used, and I, I can speak to that. It, it's very easy. It basically, you put the imagery in, you put your ground control in, and it lets you know how good your ground control is fairly early in the process. Um, and as long as you have enough processes and time, the, 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 the results are, are spectacular. We, um, and we can talk uh, a little I, bit I played more. About that. Oh, sorry, yeah, and I can forget. I can add to that if it's helpful, Jordan, on some sure. of the other packages out there. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, talk a little so bit. The underlying technologies are similar. Um, drone to map, for example, uses the PIX4D algorithm. So if you buy PIX4D, right, it's it's there. Some of the advantages of buying the full PIX4D is that they implement new solutions quicker than they end up in, in drone to map. But if you're an Esri user, drone to map can be easier. Agisoft is another program out there. All of these ones, even the online ones that we see, are functioning very, very similarly. Uh, they will allow you to feed them photos. Those photos can be taken nader, so top down, or they can be taken obliquely. I showed you that example of the rock face, right? We were not shooting those from above the rock face. We were shooting those from the side and it can generate 3D models. You can even go and shoot your iPhone with enough overlap and build a 3D model from Pix4D or probably even do it in, in drone to map and it'll work just fine. So lots of solutions out there that, that use this technology, including some, some open source ones that are a little bit more challenging to implement, but work very well. Awesome. Um, and is there any legal pushback that either of you have experienced through creating your programs, maybe from privacy-minded citizens or otherwise? We've gotten a lot of questions, but no one has ever I haven't had any negative feedback. I usually get the questions like, well, why do you have a drone program? And I explain the, the example of the water tanks, and everyone's like, oh, that makes sense. Um, I haven't had anyone tell me not to fly over their property. I haven't had anyone give me a hard time yet. I'm sure it's, it's just a matter of time, um, but... You know, for now, you know, the FAA is on our side, so they're in control of the airspace from, you know, a millimeter up to 60,000 feet, and we're a licensed operator operating in the national airspace, so, so far, so good. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Um, and so also, I just have a quick question about from a financial perspective, um, do you have any tips on creating documented metrics showing cost benefits for a drone program? Uh, like I said, for our take, um, it was just be about risk reduction. So you know, because we're not a business, we're we're, we're a municipality. Um, so I so I don't have any. I mean, we we can talk about the numbers 
as, you know, as, as, you know, of accidents that didn't happen. No one's falling off ladders, <laughs> you know, uh, doing 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 tank inspections for the last two and a half years because because I've been doing them. So. And is there a cost savings associated with that that you have from not hiring inspecting contractors as well? I, I don't have those numbers though. No, sorry. <laughs> Got you. No, no, that's okay. We're just. We're just <laughs> and, yeah, Jordan. In our case, the projects that we've done, and I mentioned that sort of airport approach analysis. Once again, that was pretty clear. A project that would take sort of three to four days was down to less than a day, and plus you got some innovative products that you wouldn't have otherwise. So those cases are clear. But I, I think Rich's point is probably the most important. You know, dangerous, dirty, difficult. Right. That's when drones succeed, and if you can save people from injuries um, or life-threatening situations, that's far more important than saving a couple days on a mapping operation. And I guess this will just add just the, the, the timeliness of it. It's just, it, it'd be really hard to compare, you know, because like when a new subdivision comes in, we can go out and fly it and have the imagery in a day. It's just not a product you could possibly buy, you know, from, from, a, from a traditional um, you know, aerial photography company. So I, it'd be really hard to compare. Definitely saving money. But <laughs> and we have a few more questions that are just coming in. So thank you everybody for keeping them coming. We're, we're going to be here as long as it takes, I guess. Um, we, ha we have another question coming in about, would you expect significant reductions in drone technology costs over time? I'm assuming that means the technology of the drone itself, as well as the ongoing operational costs behind it. Absolutely. Yeah, drone costs are coming down. Like I said, the, the, the program, the drone that we bought, you know, just two and a half years ago is now they're well under a thousand dollars. Like I said, and operational costs, I mean, they're, like I said, other than charging batteries and your software licenses, I mean, your operational costs are going to be eventually, if you're hiring, you have to hire pilots, that kind of stuff. Um, but because as far as the equipment itself, that I see that that price continuing to come down and, and just Rest assured, whatever drone you buy now, it will be obsolete in six months. So don't worry, <laughs> just go buy it now. <laughs> um, and uh, so we have another question. Thank you, Rich, by the way. Um, another question coming in, it says, are the presenters private pilots, and to what degree did the process of drone certification uh, easier? I'm sorry, it's a, so I guess, like, what, why is having drone certification making it easier to fly, and I guess like if you could speak a little bit more to your, just your, your license types and, and, and what designates you, or what your designations are as pilots, that'd be great. Yeah, in our case, we, we did have someone who was a who was a pilot. Um, as Rich, I think you mentioned, right, if you are a licensed pilot, so traditional aircraft, you can take an online test and get your UAS operator certificate. For everyone else, the, the Part 107 exam involves you going to an FAA test center and like rich mentioned really sort of proving that you understand understand largely faa regulations and airspace charts the exam does not do a good job saying can you fly a dgi phantom or a sensefly ebx or operate a a uh, parrot sequoia camera none of that stuff all that stuff you're going to have to invest time on your own and and rich you can give me your perspective but i would argue that that type of Oper those types of operations, especially when you get into the fancier equipment and operating in more challenging situations, it's far more time consuming than going out and, and taking that uh, taking that test. That exam is really that piece of paper that allows you to operate legally. And of course, if you were using your own drone that you got as a birthday present, not for any municipal activities and not for any commercial enterprises, you wouldn't even need a license. So it's, uh, some may argue, a little bit unfair in that respect. Yeah, I'll agree with uh, Jarlath there. Um, that the the test has nothing to do with actually all really about risk management and situational awareness. Um, but it's a really an important piece is getting some you know what I call you know thumb time. You know you get to get some muscle memory into your thumbs so you know you can fly safely. And that's you, you got to do that on your own. There's nothing in the FAA test about that. And um, just to speak to that a little bit, we have some feedback. It's not a question. Just saying that DJI Phantoms are very fun in sport mode. So that's really good to know. <laughs> and yeah, definitely, yes, they uh, they're not they're not super hard to operate. Um, I just went to a drone workshop uh, this past month, and everybody in the class very competently uh, drove these drones. And uh, just transitioning a little bit to a question now: um, Are there any good? And it dovetails actually perfectly with what you're saying. Are there any good study guides for the pilot certificate? Um, I'll jump in quick. And the FAA site on again FAA.gov. Uh, dot um, slash UAS. They've got a pretty good guide there, and I think it gets you probably about 80% you know, there. Um, if it, because um, 
I'm not a pilot, but I used to have some flying experience back uh, when I was in my 20s. Um, and I used that guide and with that information, plus what I knew, you know, from, from 25 years ago, I was able to, to, to pass the test. So that one, and that's free. Um, so that's pretty good. And there's lots of ones that you can go, you can go pay for, um, but just, you know, buyer beware. There's a lot, there's a lot of fly by night stuff popping up now. Um, you know, get some recommendations um, and, and, and do your research or, you know, go, go to, go to Charles's class up in Vermont. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. I, I think, I think the FAA guides are the way to go and, and save your money for the other stuff. The other stuff I think is requires more time and experience. It's the flight operations, the checklist, you know, thinking about how you're going to implement, uh, this program. It's very easy to get wrapped up in the front end things, right? Cause you've got to have that certificate in order to fly. But I think your time invested in those other things is, is money much better spent, whether it's coming up with us or, or going to a PIX 4D training or, or drone to map training, online training, whatever you do, that's really where you're going to turn your data into information that like Rich has showed you leads to a successful program. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you for adding that as well. And we do have some more questions. Um, I am going to make probably a last call for questions. Um, we're going to answer everybody's questions, but just they keep coming in, so we're just going to make a last call, I think, uh, to respect everybody's time here. Um, the next question that we have is, I was wondering more about the ROI of getting your own drone versus simply contracting out for a capture service. And and then there was another question that goes along with that. It's it's what's the range of cost for, for a contractor versus doing it yourself. Um, I think we should probably just talk a little bit more about, you know, the 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 amount of times that you're gonna use or think you're gonna use drones, you know, independently for your own use versus contracting out. And maybe you two can speak a little bit more to that as well. Yeah, I can sort of generally talk about our experiences because we do, sometimes people subcontract us when they need to. Sometimes they'll bring us in early and we'll work with them and then they'll set up their drone program. But I think it's really looking like you said, Jordan, you know, are you going to be doing the, the flights on a regular basis with this platform? And do you have the expertise needed to make that happen, right? And the, the cost that you're going to need to invest in outside of the platform for your time to study, to take the test, to do training flights, all those things could cost you a lot more than the drone and PIX4D or drone to map, what have you. So keep those in mind. And if, if you're not willing or you don't have the time to invest in those because you're so tapped out with other stuff, then you probably want to go to a contractor. And then you want to think about, you know, if you need really accurate imagery, if it's a construction site and it's got a tie in with CAD diagrams, do you also have the surveyors that can go out there and capture those? Or then are you managing an RFP to get some surveyors so that you can go out and fly, right? And then it may be advantageous to contract it out. And then I think finally it's like, do you have the specialized equipment? Maybe it's thermal, maybe it's multispectral, right? Maybe you're flying an area where it's difficult to put in ground control, so you want a drone with RTK. Then you're getting into drone systems that can cost into the tens of, or maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it may be more advantageous to contract that stuff out. And I think it's like in, in any situation, right? You could probably go out and collect data on your own, and it's just seeing if you have the time to invest in the process it takes to get your program set up and, uh, and established because Rich has had tremendous success and it sounds like you've had a lot of support, but I think you could imagine maybe your municipal government is, is less supportive and you could be tied up heavily in bureaucracy and um, looking at new policies and regulations. And in that case, you may want to just contract it out to a licensed operator who doesn't have to deal with those situations. Great. Yeah, I'd have to agree with, with, with everything there. Um, you know, with our program, you know, I'm, I'm just flying, you know, town and it, it Really, it's that very first question: Why are you flying? Right? Uh, why do you need the drone imagery? You know, how much drone imagery you need? Those are going to be the driving questions to decide. You know, it's just it's a one-off project that we need to grab this, you know, this new rail trail in town, or we really need this as part of our infrastructure, you know, asset management tool. Um, and then you want to do more things while doing it in-house. Right? Perfect, perfect. That, I think that explains that well. And and I did get a little bit of a, of a pushback on the uh, drones becoming obsolete after six months. I guess what I have to say about that is, a, you know, an iPhone 8 can, can still – you know, satisfy all your needs, or a, a Pixel 2 can satisfy all your needs, but rest assured, the Pixel 3 will come out, the iPhone 10 will come out, so just go ahead and grab that drone. <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah, I, I probably overstated that. I mean, we're, we still, I mean, our 
two and a half year old Phantom Four, we still use that all the time, and it still does a great job. It just mm-hmm. <laughs> it doesn't mean that this if we're on the Phantom Four Pro Max now or whatever the heck it is. Uh, you know, and, and the Phantom Four is no longer made, even though it's only two and a half years old. So that's all. Great. Well, I still see a ton of attendees here, so I would like to take this time um, just to thank everybody for joining us today and and how drones are enhancing, this is actually supposed to say, municipal operations. Um, And thank you just once again for for taking the time to listen to all the different ways that municipalities can use drones. And if you're not from a municipality, you can still use drones as well. If you have any more questions, don't hesitate to reach back out to me. Uh, Same email that you got before, jfrazik at appgeo.com. I will also make sure that you all get my email um, after this webinar. Um, So once again, thank you. And is there anything else that you guys wanted to mention before we end the call? No, just thank you. Thanks for having us. That's great. Perfect. Yeah, thanks. And uh, feel free to reach out um, if uh, if we can help you. And uh, good luck, everyone. And uh, if you do go down this road, uh, stay fine. And thanks, Rich. Just real pleasure to see such a successful uh, program. What great examples. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great day.